Hello, hello, hello. This is a day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Dr. Dana Carson, affectionately known as the Kingdom Voice, and I want to personally welcome you to this week's episode of Relevant Pulpits, where you get to hear uh, some of the most deep and profound discussions about different or variety or diverse areas of interest in the kingdom by some of the most dynamic, powerful, and influential voices in the kingdom of God today. And I'm so excited about today and uh, the discussion that we're going to be having and uh, uh, my guest sharing with you. But before <clears throat> we even get started, I want to make sure that uh, you support the work and give you a little time to come on in the room and uh, support relevant pulpits. Uh, we do this every week. We have a staff and um, we, we we make this happen and we hope that you're being blessed. Pastors and leaders and so forth share a blessing with us. <coughs> this week, we're going to uh, be uh, discussing some very, very powerful, this uh, episode, we're going to be discussing very, very powerful uh, uh, subject matter of the kingdom and uh, spiritual fathering and sonship. Uh, very, very, very powerful, uh, very, very powerful uh, subject matter. And I believe that this is a prophetic season in which we're in, and there is a changing of the guards as well as the changing of a theological season. And so I believe that God is doing a tremendous, tremendous work. And uh, my guest today is uh, no stranger to the subject matter, nor to the body of Christ in terms of his prophetic uh, awareness and message. Uh, he is the uh, founder, uh, the prophet and teacher of the Four Harvest International Church located in Los Angeles, California, as well as Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, has been preaching since he was 15. And um, uh, he's going to share a little bit about himself. And he's no stranger to most of the world, uh, church world, none other than Bishop Clarence McClendon. Good uh, morning or afternoon as it is, uh, wherever people are viewing us from. Good to see you, <coughs> Apostle Carson. Glad to be with you today, sir. Oh, man, it's, uh, it's a, a blessing and a privilege. Uh, sometimes I feel like I have one of the greatest honors uh, in, in the body today, uh, being able to share with some of the most influential voices in the kingdom in such a unique season and time in history to hear the minds of the men and women of God doing this time. Uh, and man, I am uh, eager for us to chop it up a little bit and uh, man, I didn't know if you knew this. I I was reading your bio. You know, uh, we almost homeboys. I didn't know if you knew that. You know, you. I didn't know you were from Decatur. You know, I'm from Chicago, man. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, you, you know, you, you're big. You're big city. You know, you're big time compared to us. Uh, yeah, us small small town boys. But yeah, yeah. We we were not far from each other at all. As a matter of fact, I used to go up to Chicago, you know, on a regular basis. My father would go up uh, and minister in Chicago on a regular basis. And my older brother and I would annually try to make it up there uh, for the New Year's Eve services with Dr. Wells and, you know, Clay Evans and others. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, man, not far at all. You, you know, uh, last week, uh, Another, another, I'm going to call him homeboy, uh, since we're Illinois, 
uh, folk uh, was with me. Uh, he was here with me. He was actually staying with me at the house for a week because we were childhood friends. We grew up together. And he told me to tell you hello. Uh, and he said, you, you, might, you might remember him. Uh, we grew up in Chicago together. Uh, Percy Beatty. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. It's astounding. Please give me my greeting. It's been a moment since I've seen Percy, but praise God for him. Good, yes. good, good brother. Now, he's in Texas now, isn't he? he no, no, no. He's in, he's in Chicago. Oh, oh, he's in Chicago. Okay. Yes, but he was, he came, his brother Ray Beatty uh, is uh, at Windsor Village uh, in uh, Houston. Okay. Uh, but he was here in Houston with me uh, just visiting. Wow. Uh, and so, yeah, he said he was going to try to catch it today, but he told me to make sure I told you hi. Well, please give him my greeting if we don't touch base uh, any other way before then. Okay. God bless him. Well, listen, Bishop, let's let's get started and chop it up a little bit, man. Uh, while uh, for many, you don't need an introduction, uh, but some that may not know you or your story, man. I always like to, on relevant pulpits, give people uh, uh, a little insight of of our of our guests, of where they come from, how they got where they are, because people see us in our glory, but they don't know our story. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so true. And so, so true. Man, well, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. No, no, go ahead. Sir. I was going to ask you, I was turning the mic. I was going to ask you to share a little bit with us about your ministry and how it started and so forth. Well, uh, you know, from a standpoint of history, I come from a long line of Baptist preachers. My father was a Baptist pastor in the Illinois region, a part of the uh, National Baptist Convention at that time. And he was what was called a moderator, which would at that time in that denomination would have been the equivalent of a bishop. He oversaw areas of Illinois, uh, portions of Missouri, Iowa, uh, that, that area there. And uh, so he was uh, one of nine boys. Uh, six of them were preachers. Uh, so there were six preachers. I had six preaching, uh, five preaching uncles, including my father, who was a pastor. My older brother, uh, Pastor Levi McClendon, is a pastor in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, he started preaching at 15. Uh, I was 13 uh, at the time. No, he started preaching at 13. I'm sorry. He started preaching at 13. I was 11 years old at the time. I began preaching at the age of 15. I, I recognized the call of God on my life at the age of seven. Uh, I knew I was called of God to the degree that any child can know, but the hand of the Lord was upon me heavily. I remember going to my father uh, and saying, Lord, you know, uh, uh, dad, how do you know if the Lord has called you to preach? And my father would say, well, if the call of God is on you, uh, you will not, it will always stay with you. You'll never be able to get out from under it. And uh, so at 15, I had an argument with the Lord because uh, I knew I was being uh, really set now to the work of ministry. Uh, but I really told the Lord, I said, you know, somebody in this family has to do something else. You've got all these preachers. Uh, I wanted to do some other things. Uh, but it was clear to me that I was called of God. Now, again, I was raised in the Baptist tradition and I started preaching. I would travel, itinerate, itinerate with my brother. Uh, my father raised us as students of the word. My father was a Baptist preacher, but he was a man of the word of God. He was a preacher of the word, not a sermonizer. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a preacher of the word of God. And he made, he made sure uh, that his, you know, his testimony was, I will never call any of my sons to preach, but I'm going to make sure they are ready if God calls them. Mm -hmm. And so in, in our household, we had to outline chapters of scripture mm -hmm. during the summer before we could go out and play basketball or play baseball or certain things. 
uh, and I'm grateful for that. I didn't like it at the time, <laughs> at the time, <laughs> but I'm grateful for it today. And so that was my uh, tradition. I started itinerating at 19. I assumed a small church under my dad's jurisdiction. One of the churches that he had raised up, you know, in uh, he would have been considered an apostle in today's contemporary Christian uh, uh, paradigm because he he started a string of churches all the way up from, you know, uh, Mississippi, Atlanta, up through Norfolk, Virginia, up to Evanston, Illinois, and then settled down in Decatur, where I was born and raised. Uh, but at 21 years of age, I started pastoring a small little church at 19 under my dad's jurisdiction. But at 21 years of age, in a time of seeking God, a time of great exasperation, desperation, felt like uh, the world was closing in on me. I was uh, working 40 hours a week. I was going to school 22 hours a semester as a uh, theology student, undergrad, uh, and pastoring a little church. And I went before the Lord. All I knew to do was fast and pray. And I said, there's got to be more to this than this. And uh, it was at that time that in a time of seeking God, I had a visitation of the Lord. I was filled with the Holy Spirit in a time of prayer in a little apartment uh, in Decatur, Illinois, at the age of 21 years old. And I need you to understand the significance of this because the first person I ever heard speak in other tongues was me. I had never been to a Pentecostal church. I had never been to a charismatic church. I had no uh, interaction. You know, I, I often jokingly say uh, that, you know, when I was being raised, you know, the Baptists thought Pentecostals were crazy and Pentecostals thought the Baptists were unsafe. You know, so they didn't even fellowship together. You know, there, right. there was no right. fellowship. There was no full gospel Baptist church. You know what I'm saying? There were no right. Baptist bishops. Right. Okay. No speaking in other tongues, God right. forbid. And so, uh, you know, I got filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as a Baptist boy preacher at 21. And the first person I ever heard speak in tongues was me. It was a extremely supernatural experience, which I won't go into here. And from there, uh, I had a, just a voracious hunger for the word of God. When I received the infilling of the Holy Spirit in that supernatural experience with God, um, uh, it, you know, the, the, the thing that I appreciated about Baptist upbringing at that time is you were, you were taught the word, you know what I'm saying? There, there was a, there was a foundation in scripture. And so all of the things that I had been taught suddenly came alive. They suddenly made sense, if you will. They, they began to come into line. From that standpoint, I, I, I did, again, all I knew to do. I fasted and prayed. And, and I literally fasted <laughs> and prayed almost four to five days a week for nine months straight. Now, it wasn't something God told me to do. It wasn't something I planned on doing. I was just so hungry. I was fasting and praying three or four days a week for nine months straight, literally. And af after the time I realized, you know, man, I've been doing this for nine months. And Apostle, uh, it was during that time that certain manifestations of the Spirit came. I had certain visitations of the Lord where certain things were told me and instructed me. And the Holy Spirit began to teach me the scriptures. Now, again, I I went to school, you know, I did the work, I, I got my degrees, I've got a, an earned and a honorary doctorate, but it was Holy Ghost University uh, <laughs> where I really began to understand the things of God and uh, set me on the way uh, to uh, the fulfillment of function in ministry where I am today. So we give God the praise for that. Yeah, you know, it's. Uh, I was listening, and uh, I've shared some of those same similarities. Uh, I uh, when I when I was baptized with the Holy Spirit, evidence was speaking with other tongues. I was in a place all by myself, and yeah. uh, and I was raised Baptist. Yeah, and so 
And one <laughs> thing about the Baptists is they have high regard for the Bible. That's if, right. That's if right. it's in that book. <laughs> If it's in the book, Doc, it's, it's got to be in the text, right? That's right. That's right. And so, you know, and also, I, I like you, I had a time, um, I don't know exactly how long it was, though, but I had a time where, man, I was fasting four to five days every week uh, because I was hungry. Yeah. I, I I just I just wanted God. And now unlike you, uh I had a heathenistic background though. So, <laughs> you know, I, you know, I was a heathen and uh I actually brought my parents. I wow. actually brought my parents back into the church. Wow. You know? But uh, so I'm a first I'm a first generational preacher. Praise and, God. And so but uh but man uh your 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 testimony is so powerful uh preaching at the age of 15 and uh your dad's wisdom uh in his response to you if the call is on you it's not going to go nowhere it's going it's you, you you eventually know for sure yourself yes that's the call of god on your life and you know i don't i don't you know the body of christ is so so massive but I, I think we were hanging around in some of the same places. We didn't necessarily know each other. No but doubt. You, because um, doing Azusa, uh, the Azusa uh, movement with with uh, with Carlton. Yes. Uh, Carlton was a, a good friend of, of, of mine. I was able to... Uh, uh, grace, uh, be graced in his home. And we shared a lot of conversations, but, uh, you were, you were around in, in that, in that area. It was a lot of us around there. Cause yeah. we, we were expecting something during that time. We really thought something then what developed was going to develop. Yeah. But then you, you went on and you became a part of the full gospel Baptist. And, you know, Bishop, Bishop Martin was on relevant pulpits with me as well. Yes. But, uh, so man, tell, tell me a little bit, uh, about your, your involvement in full gospel, how that happened and where that leaves you right now. Well, it, it was a very interesting thing. Um, and I, I, I've got to go back. You know, you were talking about the Azusa movement with Bishop Pearson and what a great uh, time and season and move of the spirit that was. You know, um, one of the things that I think is often uh, interesting for us to do, one of the things that I have found, uh, Apostle, is, you know, when you are led by the spirit of God, um, many times you are not aware of what is yeah. happening while you're being led. That's and right. it is only in retrospect yes, as right. the spirit of the Lord at times, and he's done this with me. He's, he's sort of pulled me aside at times and said, now, now let me show you what I did. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You, know, you had no idea what I was doing. Mm -hmm. You were just following, you, you know, my leading, but let me show you what I did. And so, you know, I, I think about, you know, in a, in a very short capsule, you know, I, I was supernaturally brought through a series of events uh, to from Illinois to Los Angeles, uh, assumed a small uh, Pentecostal work in the four square denomination. It was there that I became acquainted with Pastor Carlton Pearson uh, and and then uh, a relationship developed there. Um, and, you know, in retrospect, one of the things I, I believe is that God used Carlton, mm -hmm. and I mean no disrespect yeah. to him, uh, Bishop Pearson, uh, that God used him almost as a gathering point for the diaspora of charismatic and Pentecostal persons of color in the United States who had been fractured and fragmented. Mm -hmm. by, for a number of reasons. And then those of us like us who came into the charismatic or Pentecostal 
uh, awareness uh, through no quote organism, organization, leadership, whatever. It was just a sovereign type of thing. Yeah. And God sort of used uh, Bishop Pearson as a gatherer. I, I think many of us thought that some sort of government was going to come out of that move. Uh, but in retrospect, I believe it was just a gathering move, not a governing move. Mm -hmm. And I believe that uh, that a number of fellowships, a number of uh, reformations, a number of other things yeah, yeah. were a product of that gathering where men and women of like faith were gathered together in those Azusa meetings, found out about each other. I mean, I remember, I was thinking here not long ago, I remember sitting in uh, Carlton's home after one of those Azusa meetings, mm -hmm. after one of the nights, Mm -hmm. And we were there, in his home, and I remember this vividly, sitting around that table that night at his house. I was 29 years old, maybe 29, 30 years old, sitting around that room, sitting around that table were Miles Monroe, uh, uh, Bishop Morton, uh, Bishop uh, uh, T.D. Jakes, myself, a brother by the name of Raphael Green out of uh, Missouri, uh, Mark Sharona. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I remember sitting here in this meeting and none of us had any sort of visibility or notoriety at the time. Mm -hmm. None of us had any sort of television ministry or you know, national or international voice at the time, but we were all sitting around that table and talking and discussing things. And from that, a number of things were birthed. And so I believe God used that move uh, to bring together men and or women of like mind or the same spirit of faith, if you will. <clears throat> and then they were released to go and do other things. And then uh, it was there that I met Bishop Morton. That was the first time I had heard of Bishop Morton uh, officially. And, uh, you know, I just began to find out who he was, and I did, uh, it was not long after that, I remember sitting in the Azusa conference, and the Lord said to me, it, it was in the Azusa conference that I got the call to go on television. I was sitting there and the Lord said, now, when you get back home, I want you to pursue television. I, I knew nothing about television except for how to turn one on. You know what I'm saying? I, I, was, I was clueless about TV ministry, but I was sitting there when the Lord spoke to me about that. And then he birthed in me that I was to do a conference, which we called Harvest Fire. We did it for eight years on the West Coast. And I invited Bishop Morton to preach in my Harvest Fire conference. And I'm talking, I'm getting to now uh, uh, full gospel. So when Bishop Morton preached in my Harvest Fire conference, it was just at the beginning. They hadn't actually done the first uh, conference of full gospel yet. And it was about a year or so before that was about to happen. Bishop Morton preached, you know, and he was in my office afterwards, changing out of his cassock. And I, I was leaving the room to let him change. He had preached a magnificent sermon. And Bishop Morton said to me, he said, you know, there's, I, I'm starting a, a movement. Uh, he didn't really call it a movement. He said, I'm gathering some brothers to do certain things, et cetera, you know. And he says, I really believe that it's the Lord's will for you to help me and be a part of this move uh, called the Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship. And I said to Bishop Morton, I was leaving, I said, well, Bishop, I'm very honored. Um, I'm very humbled. And, you know, I'll pray about that and I will get back to you. I was walking out of my office to allow him to change and when I was walking out of my office, the spirit of the Lord said to me, you don't need to pray about this. He says, this is an answer to the prayer you prayed when you got filled with the Holy Ghost and saw what I did with you. And you asked me to pour my spirit out on Baptist people. He said, this is an answer to that prayer. You don't need to pray about this. Turn around, tell the man you'll help him. I had no idea what he wanted me to do no idea that I was going to be 
a bishop, his first assistant, then become the third presiding bishop. I had no idea. All I knew was I had prayed when I got filled with the Holy Ghost and I saw what that experience and manifestation had accomplished in my life. I began to pray at 23, 24, 25 years old, God, pour your spirit out on Baptist people because they got the word, they love you. And when this happens, they'll come to a whole nother dimension. So when Bishop Morton asked me that, and again, I was trying to be, you know, I was trying to be young and spiritual and erudite, you know, not to, uh, but he said, uh, I want you to help. I said, I'll pray about it. I was walking out the door. The Holy Spirit said, no, this is an answer to the prayer you've already prayed. Turn around and tell him you'll do it. And that was it. That's how I became a part of the full gospel Baptist church fellowship. Wow. You know, uh, Bishop. Um, and I love that man to this day. He is my father in the Episcopacy. He is an Episcopal father, not a spiritual father to me, but an Episcopal father to me. You no, know, I, I love him as well. Bishop uh, is one of a kind. You know, but it's it's interesting when we when we look back at uh, the Azusa, the full gospel, and then the movements that have been birthed since Azusa and what God is doing and yeah. what God is doing now, because I believe that this is very much a prophetic season. Uh, I believe that. COVID-19 um, gave birth to a new, new needed and necessary season in the life of the church globally. Yes. Uh, I believe that um, we are transitioning now out of a uh, looking at the church as a sociological phenomenon uh, and moving more into an understanding of the body of Christ in terms of the kingdom of God. Yes, so, sir. So I believe that we're moving now uh, into the dispensation, so to say, of the kingdom. And I believe that this is an end time uh, move. Jesus said, uh, in Matthew 24 and 14, and this gospel of the kingdom uh, yeah. preached around the world as a witness. Don't, and don't, don't start, don't start, don't start, Apostle. Don't, don't start now. <laughs> so, Go ahead, I'm listening. Yes, sir. So, so, you know, he didn't say just any gospel. He says this one, yes, this sir. one that I'm preaching, this yes. version of the gospel, not just any. And I believe that we have finally come to the point that uh, the uh, this gospel can be preached. I believe that uh, during the height of COVID, uh, things have been made clear in the body of Christ, especially in America, of where people stand uh, in Man the of church. God. And uh, I believe now we are finally situated to make a move from Romanization of the gospel, Europe, Europeanization of the gospel, colonization of the gospel, Westernization of the gospel, Americanization of the gospel. Wow. And I believe that those positions and contexts have distorted uh, our understanding of the word of God but I believe now a clear line of demarcation has been drawn in the sand. And I believe God is raising up now a new generation. And uh, with, with sadness, we know that we lost a lot of ecclesiastical inventory, especially in the African-American community during COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, but you know, when God moves one, he raises another. Yes. And, and I believe that this season is bringing us into a new season of fathering. Uh, and some of our uh, fathers have been taken. We would have thought it was prematurely, but uh, the sovereign will of God had it so that uh, they transitioned. But you know, men like yourself, men like myself, I, I, it's hard for me to see myself 
uh, in past my ego as a father because you know I, you know I still I still want to see myself as a son you know yeah but yeah. Uh, but you you're you, we, we're we're of that age and I remember Noel and I was talking and we was uh, Noel was sitting across the table and he said Dana man you and I uh, we're fathers now and I was like <laughs> I, I was like no. You, the, you a father, not right, me. Right, <laughs> right. But that, that we've been catapulted into this season of kingdom. And there is a sense of government and perspective of government that comes with the kingdom that is, uh, it's, it's clear, it's more clearly defined when you look at government through the, the lens of the kingdom then you do a sociological church. Yeah. And so then, <clears throat> excuse me, then when you when you look at it through the lens of the kingdom, uh, fathering and sonship uh, is, is much different than we've looked at it through the sociological lens of the church. So man, let's talk about that a little bit. I know uh, we didn't talk about COVID, but I I, 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 I know that uh, God has given you uh, great, great pieces on this uh, about father, father, spiritual fathering and sonship. So let's talk about that a little bit, Bishop. Well, I mean, uh, Apostle, you said so much just in the last seven or eight minutes, I mean, it would take us about three hours just to unpack uh, what you just said. So, it, you know, if we need to go a little longer, I'm open to that today. I've, I've, I've got the time uh, this morning. But but the things that you said are so profound. Uh, they are accurate. I believe both uh, uh, intellectually and spiritually. And I think this idea of the kingdom is very, very important. So, so I, I want to just I want to start from there real quick and then go to the father son uh, uh, discussion because you know the, the Bible teaches us that these things in the old covenant are written for our admonition and for our instruction, the Bible says, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So that from the old covenant, we are to see the types and shadows of the things that we have and are to operate in, in substance, the Bible says, in Christ Jesus. So, so, so let's look, for instance, at the uh, initiation of the kingdom in the old covenant paradigm. You have, uh, God takes the children of Israel through a period of what is called the period of the judges. When, after the children of Israel have come into their territory and Joshua is gone, Moses has fulfilled his assignment, Joshua has, then you have this season of the judges that is raised up. And so God raises up individual judges. Uh, Samson was a judge. Uh, Deborah was a, a judge. Uh, Gideon, these were judges. And these were individuals who were raised up to begin to deliver the children of Israel from specific enemies. They, 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 there were specific enemies. So, so, uh, uh, you know, Samson was the Philistines. Gideon was the Midianites. There were specific adversaries right. that individuals were raised up to. I believe the church has been in a period of judges where great singular men and or women were raised up. Oral Roberts, uh, uh, A. A. Allen, uh, Kenneth Hagan. We just saw the home going of another great uh, right. uh, man of God. Uh, a, a judge, literally, Apostle Price. These were men and women raised up to begin to deliver the children of God from certain enemies. The last judge was Samuel. Samuel is the last judge in Israel, but Samuel is also a prophet. And Samuel is the judge with a prophetic anointing that transitions Israel from the season of judges to the season of the kingdom. Samuel is the last judge, but Samuel is the prophet that anoints the first king. That is Saul. So you have the prophetic anointing, which is why the prophetic is so significant right now and why the enemy is attempting to distort it and besmirch it because it is such a vital and significant aspect of this transition. 
So you have the last judge, Samuel, who's also a prophet, who with his prophetic anointing transitions Israel from the season of judges to the season of kings. There are no more judges now in Israel. Now it is the season of kings. You've now come into the season of the kingdom. I believe now we are in that season. And I believe, as you said, God didn't bring the COVID-19 pandemic, but has used it to bring about his purposes in the earth for those that have ears to hear. So now we're in the, 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 the season of the kingdom, which is a season where not only will great men and women of God be raised up, God will always have great men and women of God he uses. But the mantles that have fallen from these uh, judges and these leaders of a previous generation are not necessarily going to be picked up by one man or woman because we're no longer in a judge season. We're in a kingdom season. So these mantles are going to fall on several men and women, several aspects, because there is a kingdom of God move now. Now, the kingdom of God is a government. A kingdom is a government. And this has to do with moving from the sociological aspect, as you said, of church anity to a kingdom mindset and a kingdom move. The kingdom of God is a government. And peoples become governments or uh, peoples become nations with government. I'm going to say that again. Peoples and tribes become nations with government. Until a government is established, you are not a nation. You are just a people. You are just a tribe. So peoples become nations with government. We are not called a holy tribe or a holy people. We are called a holy nation. Hagios ethnos in Greek, a separate or distinct ethnicity. That requires governing. And so now we've got to go back into the old covenant paradigm and look at the government of God. Because if we are transitioning from a church modality, sociological, institutional church modality, which we are, to a kingdom modality, once again, the word kingdom in Greek, as Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God, the Greek word that is used there is the Greek word basilius, which means the rule, the realm, and the royalty of God. So the kingdom of God is the rule of God. How does God rule? How does he govern? How does he get things done? The kingdom of God is the realm of God. Now, a realm in a kingdom is the territory over which the sovereign presides. In, uh, in Great Britain, they have what is called the realm of the queen. Well, the realm of the queen is larger than Britain. It is it, 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 larger than Great Britain. It is all the territories over which that sovereign presides, which they call the Commonwealth. Okay, so so the the realm of God expands as the people of God take territory that is not simply taken by church activity, and then you have the royalty of God. The royalty of a kingdom has to do with its protocol its principles. When the queen of Sheba comes to observe uh, the kingdom of God under Solomon, she is, a, she is taken aback by the protocol, by the way things are done, by the way his ministers are dressed, by the way they wait. These are the things she said. So the, the kingdom of God is the rule of God. How does God govern? It's the realm of God. It's the territory over which the sovereign rules and is to rule. And the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So the difference between church and kingdom, see the kingdom of God is larger than the church. I often say that God's desire is to get children of the kingdom into the world, not into the church. The destination for kingdom children is to occupy territory in the systems of the world, not just in the church. See, in the sociological intellectual church system. We have created a system where people want to be something in church. I want to be a deacon. I want to be an elder. I want to be a minister. And if you're not doing anything in church, if you don't have a title in church, you're not anything. The kingdom mentality is not to try to get people to become something in church. It's to attempt to get them to become something in the world 
system. And I often say, you know, the difference between the church and the kingdom mentality is the church has become the university from which no one ever graduates. We stay in, we stay in, we stay in, but we never go out and do anything in occupancy. So now we've got to deal with government. We got to deal with government. And if you go back to the old covenant paradigm once again, the, the principle of priesthood was this. You could not be a priest unless you were the son of a priest. In the And again, when I say son, for all the women and females who are listening, in Hebrew, the word son is not a gender specific term. In Hebrew, the word son means one with the nature and character of. So son in Hebrew is not a reference to gender. It's a reference to nature and character. So, so the, the principle of the old covenant was you could not be a priest unless you were the son of the priest. So your right to ministry. Now, this is the difference between church as an institution and kingdom as a government. So your right to ministry, according to the old covenant paradigm, was not gifting. It was not talent. It was relationship. You could not be a priest unless you were the son of a priest. It was Aaron and his sons. It was Levi and his sons. So sonship, not gifting. Sonship, not talent. Sonship, not even tenure was the key to ministry in the Old Covenant paradigm. So we see this throughout the Old Covenant, and now we come into the kingdom of God. It's interesting, at the close of the Old Covenant, God says, behold, I send the prophet Elijah. And he talks about what the prophet Elijah will do. He, he talks about, uh, you know, uh, I send Elijah the prophet before my messenger, who will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with the curse. Now notice what the prophet Malachi says, I will send the prophet Elijah. The Jews interpreted that, the Pharisees, the Sadducees interpreted that so literally that they were looking for Elijah to the point that you remember uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, when the voice comes and, and says, this is my beloved son, they ask him, well, why then do the Pharisees say Elijah must come? And Jesus tells them, I'm in Matthew 17. Now, Jesus tells them, I tell you, Elijah has come already, but they didn't know it. Speaking of John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go back to Malachi. He says, I send the prophet Elijah. Why Elijah? Why not the prophet Jeremiah? Why not the prophet Isaiah? Isaiah had much more messianic insight. Isaiah had more messianic prophecies in his writing. Elijah doesn't even have a book named after him. <laughs> but, but why the prophet Elijah? Because the prophet Elijah is the only old covenant prophet who is directed and does to leave a son in his place. Elijah is the only old covenant prophet who leaves a son to occupy the very place that he occupied in the prophetic uh, uh, structure of Israel. And so God says, I'm sending the prophet Elijah. What is he saying? I am going to reinstitute this sonship principle. So now we go to the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. You remember the story. The Bible declares that Jesus comes to John to be baptized and John the Baptist looks at Jesus and says, wait a minute, you come to me to be baptized? I have need to be baptized of thee. And what does Jesus say to John? He says, suffer it or literally allow it, permit it to be so now. Right. For it behooves us to fulfill all righteousness. Translation, we got to fulfill the pattern. You are the prophetic move before me. You are the father of the prophetic school of God before me, of the prophetic move of God 
before me. And now it doesn't matter whether I'm greater than you, more gifted than you. It doesn't matter whether I am above you in the hierarchy, if you will, of the structure of significance in the plan of God. The fact of the matter is you are carrying the anointing and the grace that I have to have to come into my destiny. So suffer it now for it fulfills us, for it behooves us to fulfill all righteousness. What happens? Jesus submits to John's authority, even though Jesus is the greater of the two. And what happens? The Bible says when he comes up out of the water, the heavens open, the spirit of God descends on him in the form of a dove and a voice comes and says, this is my beloved son, not my beloved prophet, not my beloved Messiah, not my beloved reconciler, not my beloved advocate, not my beloved high priest, my beloved son, hear him. So until somebody calls you son, until a voice above you calls you son, you have no right to ministry. Ooh. You may have gift for ministry. You may have calling for ministry. That's good. That's good. Bishop. You have no right to ministry. And our problem is we have brought men and women into ministry on the basis of gifting, on the basis of talent, on the, on the basis of other things, and not on the basis of relationship or sonship. And so for the kingdom to come and for the evidence of the kingdom to be manifest, that pattern has to be restored in this generation by what I call relational ministry, a ministry from father to son. And that, that means a couple of things. That means men of God like you and I who are coming into this fathering responsibility we have to acknowledge it. We have to embrace it. And it's not an easy thing to do. Right. I mean, nobody really wants to do it because there is no pattern for it except the scriptural pattern for it. And again, I will never uncover the nakedness of fathers who have gone before us. But the reality is that there has not been a great deal of fathering because fathers didn't really know how to father. Mm -hmm. We don't have tremendous exactly. examples. So we have to discover it and we have to recognize we're going to make errors in the process. You know, I love the scripture that says Elijah was a man of like passions as we are, <laughs> yet he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, it did not rain. Meaning, you know, uh, being a father doesn't mean you're flawless. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, I'll say this because I don't know how much time I have. I want to give it mm -hmm. back to you because I know men and women of God are listening to us. But in the in the story of Elijah and Elisha and everybody, you know, everybody preaches about that where Elijah gets the mantle. Elisha gets the mantle. Oh, goodness. <laughs> in that story. Elijah, the father, gives Elisha the one who is going to be his son and receive his mantle. Elisha has three specific opportunities initiated by his father to leave him. That's right. I'm, I'm going to say that again. That's right. He has three specific opportunities initiated by his father. Elijah says, you know, you stay here. I'm going here. And Elisha says, ha, ha, uh, uh, <laughs> as the Lord God lives, I'm going to translate now. You got my stuff and I'm not leaving you even if you want me to. I'm not going anywhere even if you say I need to stay. In other words, I will. It, I, I, now, how does that happen? It happens through offense. It happens through failure. It happens through disappointment. It happens through if there's one thing that by the grace of God, the Lord has empowered me to do. He has empowered me to stay with fathers until I got what they were to impart to me and always depart in peace, always depart in agreement, never in strife or discord. I, I would never let anyone offend me out of the place God set me. I'll never forget one time 
I was praying about certain things. And the spirit of the Lord said to me, he said, son, anyone, anything, any offense, anything that can keep you from serving what I've set you can keep you from greatness. Because I told you, he that would be greatest must be your servant. And the moment you lose someone to serve, you have also lost your next promotion to greatness because this is the paradigm of the kingdom. This is not something that has been instituted by men. It's the pattern of God. And let me just say this and I'll throw it back to you, apostle. Let me show you how important God's patterns are. Let me show you. And I'm talking to son. And so <laughs> I got two things to say by the Holy Ghost and I'll be quiet. And the Lord just said, say this. So I'm gonna say, it. Let, me, let, let me show you how important patterns are. When God establishes a pattern, and see, what we have not understood is that we think that God's power just falls on preaching. God's power falls on pattern, not just preaching. And that's why even in the Western church in America, we have some of the greatest preachers on the planet, but we don't have the greatest power in movement in the planet because the power of God doesn't just fall on preaching. It falls on pattern. Let me get, show you how important pattern is. When Judas falls by transgression, according to the scripture, wasn't an error. It was supposed to happen. But when Judas falls by transgression, in Acts chapter one, Peter is given the responsibility of moving this thing along by the Holy Ghost. And he says, of one of those that went in and out among us all the time that Jesus of Nazareth was with us, one must be chosen to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they chose Matthias to replace Judas. Why is that in the Bible? Why is that even given to us by the Holy Ghost? Because we don't hear anything more from Matthias throughout the rest of scripture. His name is never mentioned. We never hear anything he did. But that is included because Jesus left a pattern of 12 and they had to fulfill the pattern. And once the pattern is fulfilled, the power of God falls in Acts chapter two. Now, let me go back to old covenant. <laughs> let me go back to old covenant paradigm because there are men and women who are listening to me and listening to us. And the spirit of God has been dealing with them about such things and confirming certain things in them. And I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how important this is. In Leviticus 25, where the Jubilee is articulated, and the Jubilee was to come every 50 years. And of course, in the new covenant, Christ Jesus is our Jubilee, right? But in the principle of Jubilee, Several things were to happen. Again, all debt was forgiven, of course. Um, uh, possessions were returned back to the original owner. Uh -huh. But it said, and each one of you shall go back to his family and to his possession. You go back to your family and to your possession. Now, why is going back to your family important? Because according to the law of Moses, again, old covenant, type and shadow, inheritance was according to the tribe of your father. In other words, if you got disconnected from your paternity, you were disconnected from your inheritance. Mm -hmm. So coming back into your father's house, mm -hmm. into your father's lineage, was a key to you receiving inheritance. Now remember, inheritance is not something you work for. Inheritance is something that has already been worked for and you receive as a result of your knowledge of the will. <laughs> your knowledge of the will of God. So what we continue to do in the church in the West we have to begin a new move of God with the death of every general. We have to start a new move of the spirit with the death of every spiritual leader 
because no one is receiving anything by inheritance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we are out of alignment with the paternal pattern of God, even though we have great preaching uh, and great other things. I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop right there. And, and so, so there the spirit of God, I believe, apostle, is leading men and women to fathers sons and alignment and it doesn't matter if your church is bigger than your father's it doesn't matter if you think you've got a greater anointing than the man or woman that god is connecting you to it is the pattern that has to be fulfilled oh man uh bishop this uh this is great doc i was just i was just sitting and listening now do you i you i didn't have to work at all today i just <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, you're I, working, sir. You're working. <laughs> no, man, this this is uh, powerful because this this concept is a concept that one some people are totally ignorant of, yes. and then two some people are negligent of it. Uh, they're aware, uh, but they don't they don't subscribe to sonship because they have that bastard spirit. Yeah. And, 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 um, and, but when you look at, you talked about the patterns and when you look the last commit, the great commission, Jesus said, go ye therefore and make disciples. Methatuo, the Greek term, the Hebrew concept is Talmudim. And, and which means you become a son of your teacher. That's and right. Subscribe not to just his teaching, but you subscribe to the man, his whole way of life. And uh, and that's such brother, so, you into something there. <laughs> so so Jesus releases and commands us to go make sons in the kingdom. And unfortunately, um, Paul, Paul, Paul even says, you know, you have many teachers, but not many fathers. Yes. And, and so when you talk about the kingdom, the kingdom is creating sons. Now, we in um, so the sociological church, and when you look at what I wrote a book called The Five Watersheds of History and Theology, uh, a 21st century look uh, at Christianity in light of cultural distortions and the kingdom of God. Please send me that book. Okay. Now, oh, okay. now uh, but here is a problem. When we look at uh, the Romanization of Christianity, it dispelled Second Temple Judaism and uh, they were anti-Semitic. So it took away the cultural context of the kingdom and replaced it with Roman culture. And mm. so now we interpreted the scriptures through the lens of Romanization. And then we uh, went to the next level and we then use Europeanization. And then we replace the figures and the people with European figures and so forth. And yeah. then Westernization, then we have culture, the to I mean, colonization, excuse me. We have domination. Uh, and when we have colonization, what happens is you see dispensationalists uh, stating that there's no such thing as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And what get, is given the authority uh, is the slave master and the sociological church. And so you don't create a, a sonship spirit, you create wow slave spirit and it's a slave that is unhuman it's three-fifths of a human and so once you start trying to uh, communicate what you were just communicating about son the paradigm doesn't work in that context right because there's an inconsistency of biblical theology and church practice yeah and and, and so um when you then move then to western westernizing and americanizing i don't want to go through all that but it's so important it, it puts us in a place though 
where we're confused about sonship because now racism, classism, sexism, and even denominationalism and egotism, the five tisms <laughs> take over uh, the positioning of the church. And so this whole concept of sonship uh, is not possible. But when you're talking about the kingdom, you know, even when they were to take on Tara, the yoke of Tara, they became sons of the kingdom. The, yes. uh, when, when they had their bar mitzvah, they became sons of the commandments of Torah. Sonship is necessary. And you, you said something that's very powerful, Bishop, and, and, uh, and, 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 might, and might need just a little bit more uh, uh, discussion. And you were talking about sons not uncovering the, 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 the nakedness uh, the shame of the nakedness of the fathers in our in uh, our modern or contemporary pattern of starting churches <laughs> is quite the opposite. Sure, People, they try to bring shame to their fathers and start churches out of rebellion and 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 a bastardized spirit. Right. Uh, talk a little bit about that, Bishop. Well, I think Apostle. Uh, Quite frankly, the the digression uh, that you just spoke of of Christianity fr it, from you know Romanization and colonialization and Western and Westernization those spirits have now permeated the church culture to the point that they are passed down generation after generation if we don't start once again at the root That's right. and begin to build up. John the Baptist said, and now the ax is laid to the root of the tree. See, a part of the prophetic responsibility is dealing with root and not fruit of problems. Uh -huh. And that is one of the reasons why God gives right. that insight. So I think you have hit the nail on the head. And I go back to the scriptures. God says in Malachi, he says, I, um, I'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, hearts of children, fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. What does that mean? It means wherever that father, son, wherever that kingdom paradigm of paternal uh, transference is not happening, the curse is operating. You, yeah. you don't have to curse it. The curse is in it. It's sort of like what Jesus, I mean, it's sort of like what the Bible says, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow in it. Meaning if riches are coming outside of the blessing of the Lord, the curse is already in it. You, you don't have to be concerned. So, so we are inheriting a cursed paradigm. Hmm. We, we, are, we are functioning under a cursed inheritance that has come to us not from the scriptures and from the Lord, but from the world paradigm and from its system, because we have adopted those systems right. in church government That's right. and, 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 and religion. So here we have this, this curse. Again, I go back uh, quickly to uh, uh, 1 Chronicles 13, where David's trying to restore the Ark of the Covenant to Israel. And he's got a good idea, but he's got the wrong pattern. He wants the glory back, but he's got the wrong pattern. And so he, 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 you know, he creates an ox cart, puts the ark on an ox cart. What is an ox cart? It's a man-made structure. Right. So he puts the glory of God on a man-made structure. That's and right. while they're trying to do a good thing, a well-intentioned man That's by the right. name of Uzzah, when That's the right. ark becomes destabilized, reaches out and touches it, and he's struck dead. The Bible says that David got mad at God mm -hmm. <laughs> that day. Mm -hmm. Now get it. You got a spiritual leader who's mad at God because his attempt to restore glory is interrupted. Mm -hmm. But then the Bible also says David went back mm -hmm. and consulted the Lord. And then he comes back the next time and says, oh, I found out we didn't do it according to the proper pattern is the word he uses. Mm -hmm. And he finds out that the ark is to be covered on 
the shoulders of the priest. What is that? Relational priesthood. It's father, son. It's relational ministry. The ark is to be covered, to be carried on the shoulders of the priest, relational priesthood and ministry, and not man-made structures. Yes, so right. here's the point. And I'll never forget, I was reading this one day. And the Lord says to me, good men die trying to do glorious things the wrong way. Uzzah dies because his because the structure is wrong. That's not right. because the idea is wrong. Right. So the thing is not fulfilled. It does not come to pass. Not because your vision is wrong, preacher. Your pattern is wrong. It's not because your preaching is wrong. Your pattern is wrong. Now, so how do we address it? Once again, I think we've got to go back to biblical foundation. And we've got to begin as best we can by the grace of God and by the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to begin to preach and teach these things to our ministry sons and daughters mm -hmm. and attempt by the grace of God to perpetuate it in that way. Yeah, Bishop, this is, this is uh, so powerful. Uh, so powerful. We uh, we have a uh, uh, few questions. I wanna uh, wanna they wanna shoot at shoot at us. So here's the first question: How can I become a son like Elijah? Uh, and I guess they they may be saying Elisha. Yeah, I think yeah. I, yeah. I would I would suppose yeah. uh, that they mean Elisha. Well, once yeah. again. The joinings of God are divine and they are sovereign. Uh, and so, you know, the first thing is you have to be led by the spirit of God. Uh, you have to understand that if you are a child of God, if you are in the kingdom of God, God is going to lead you to a divine joining of paternal responsibility. The psalmist said, God sets the solitary in families. The single or the individual, he sets in families. Now the Hebrew word for family is mishpaka. It's a very interesting word because it doesn't just mean someone with the same, uh, natural flesh as you. Um, if you look up the word family, mishpaka in Hebrew, it actually carries with the connotation of class or, uh, or structure. And I was meditating in this some time ago. And the Lord said, when I say class, he's not talking about class like higher class or lower class. It's talking about class like university class. See, when you go to the university and you're a pre-law major, you are in class. You, you take classes with other people who are going into pre-law or going to law school, which means you are being connected with people whose destinies are similar to yours. When the Bible says God takes the, in the solitary and puts them in families, he's basically saying, what I do is I join you by the spirit to people who have similar purpose and destiny to you, which is why I tell people, you cannot choose your father or your pastor on the internet. You, you, can't, you can't choose your father or pastor on YouTube. It's gotta be a divine joining. And once you find it, you must understand. It's almost, it's, how do I become a son like Elisha? First of all, you have to understand. You, the son, has to understand. Well, I'm going to say something strong here. You, the son, has to understand that if God has joined you to someone, it's not just because they can preach or teach or you like them or you like the way they dress. It's because they are carrying the substance of your destiny spiritually. You have to understand that. Because when you understand that, an offense or disappointment can't run you away. Right. I'm not here because I like you. I'm here 
because you got my stuff. And then you've got to refuse. You got to refuse to leave, like I said, until the Lord releases you. And if the Lord releases you, then you can go. But until he releases you from that assignment, you have no right to leave. Talk, talk, Bishop. You have no right to leave. And as a matter of fact, when the spirit of the Lord gave me this kind of understanding, and I began to teach this, I was thinking of this uh, apostle. You went to school. I went to school. If you're in a class for a certain major, right, and you choose, and one thing about college, you know, once I got to college, you know, you had these big lectures. I, I went to the University of Illinois for several years, and then Millican Presbyterian Theological and then other things. But but you had these big classes with, you know, 500, 600, 700 people and one professor. And, you know, they wouldn't miss you if you didn't go to class. You didn't have to. You, you could say you you could take the class and not show up all month. But here's the point. Because it's your class. There is information being disseminated there that you are going to be tested on. And if you miss the class, you will fail the test. See, here's what people, here's what happens in the church because we don't understand kingdom. We don't understand divine order and protocol. People are joined to a man or woman of God. They get offended. They get mad. Something happens. They leave. And then their lives go downhill because you have left the place where the information is being disseminated for the test your life is going to go through. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have to recognize the divine joining and then stay with it. I'll say one more thing about this. You preaching, Bishop. <laughs> I'll say one more thing about this. Jonathan died with Saul when he should have reigned with David. Say it again. Jonathan, Saul's son, died with Saul when he should have reigned with David because he exalted a natural joining over a spiritual joining. The Bible says God had knit David and Jonathan's hearts together that the love of them was greater than the love of women. In other words, there was such a supernatural joining there. And see, one of the things we've got to understand is we do not get the right to choose our joinings. We only get the right to recognize them and honor them. You don't get the right to choose who God joins you to. That's right. That's you only right. get the right to recognize it and honor it. So Jonathan dies with Saul when he should have reigned with David because he exalted a natural joining over a spiritual one. So how do you become a son like Elijah? You allow the Holy Spirit to connect you and you refuse to leave until the Holy Spirit releases you. That's powerful. That's powerful, Bishop. Listen, let me uh, let me ask you. I'm gonna. Ask, we got two more questions. I'm going to ask. Then uh, here's one. How does one handle the bastard son who speaks negatively of their spiritual father while requiring submission from their flock? Okay. So I guess they're saying this is a pastor who has a, a spiritual father who's speaking negatively of their covering while they're seeking submission from their, from their congregation? Uh, well, uh, the first thing you do is you forgive them before the Lord. Then you pray for them. And then you do good to them. That's what Jesus said, do. <laughs> and, and see, uh, again, what kingdom activity allows, let me, what, uh, this is where we've got to get to the point, my brothers and sisters, where we trust the power of God and not the structures of men. Here's one of the things that I have, learned. Jesus, for instance, says, uh, let me, let me, he, he says one place that I'm, I'm going to go through this methodically. 
He says, if your brother offends you, go to him. Confront him. So there's a responsibility there. If you are the father, to go to the son privately and correct him. He said, if he will not hear you, take another one with you. And then if we will not hear them, then tell it to the church. That's right. And then if they will not hear the church, then let them be counted to you as a publican or sinner. Now, here's the point. What does the church do with publicans and sinners? Do we judge them? Do we damn them? Do we talk about them? No, we pray for them. <laughs> we pray that God's restorative and reconciliatory power Mm -hmm. would move in that light. But here's the point. The reason that Jesus tells us what to do is because when we act on his word, then the power of God is released to go into operation into the situation. See, there's a lot, there's a lot of situations in which God has no open door to go in and correct a thing mm -hmm. because we don't take the biblical steps he told us to take. That's right. My first question to the father would be, have you gone to the bastard son mm -hmm. and have you said, listen, this is out of order. Now you have done it. I'm not going to talk about you. I'm not going to judge you or condemn you, but I'm doing what the word of God says. I'm coming to you as a father and saying to you, this was out of order. And my desire is not only for you to be blessed and to be prospered, my desire is for us to have a relationship, but I need to see mm -hmm. just that will release the power of God. And listen, God's word is true. If that actually was done and you do what the word says, that thing will not prosper. I don't care. It doesn't matter. It may look like it's doing fine, for, but it won't last. Mm -hmm. And your job as a father is not to put your mouth on it, publicly not to talk about it to release it to god now, again it hurts sure mm -hmm. but as jesus says <laughs> this is what we must do and i will say this prophetically i don't know the situation i don't know the person but i'll tell you this if you do what jesus says and that shepherd that pastor whoever they are don't there won't be a flock there to submit to them for very long mm -hmm. God will see to it because the thing is out of order and someone put his word to work in the matter. Powerful Bishop. Last, last question. Uh, then I'm going to, uh, then I'm going to have you uh, give us closing comments, but here's the uh, last question. How can I put myself in a position to never become offended? I guess it's an offended with the father. How can you put yourself in a position never to become offended to the father? Die and go to heaven. There's no other way. Uh, you, you would have to die today and go to heaven. Now, now you say, why, why do I say that? Listen to the words of Jesus. Again, see, this is not one of these verses we confess, apostle. It's not one of these things we stand on. But Jesus says, I think it's Luke 17, it is impossible <laughs> that no offenses should come. Yeah, yeah. Jesus said, it is impossible that no offenses should come. Yeah. And, but, but what he does say is this. He says, when you're offended, your first responsibility, your first responsibility is to take heed to yourself. That's the first instruction Jesus gives. Jesus, uh, you know, uh, Luke 7, it is impossible that no offense should come, but woe to him. The word woe means cursed, but cursed to him through who they come. There's a curse operating mm -hmm. through who they come. It would be better for them that a millstone be hanged around their neck than they would defend, offend one of these by little ones. But he says, but when you're offended, take heed to yourself. So, you cannot put your possess, yourself in a position where you never become offended, but you can put yourself in a position where an offense never stops your purpose or destiny and upward mobility. And yeah. that is 
in the place where you properly respond to offense and uh, uh, you you don't. <laughs> I remember uh, 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 something that Dr. Larry Lee said a long time ago, did it with offense. He said, you don't curse it. You don't nurse it. He said, you disperse it and reverse it. In other words, you don't meditate on it. <laughs> you, you don't know what you do is you take it before the Lord and you leave it with him. And you, you know, and look, I have been offended in the kingdom of God by men and women, brothers and sisters, where I had to go into the presence of God and stay there until I knew the thing was off of me. And, and there is a place of release where you deal with it with God. Now, again, it doesn't take long for me to do it now because I know it by faith and the muscle has been built. <laughs> you know, it, it's been built it up now. It doesn't take me long. I can do it in a minute. I go, I did, I'm, it's over, it's done, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but uh, there's no place in this kingdom. So you've got to understand this about offense. And whoever it is that is listening to this, I want you to hear this very clearly because this piece of instruction will transform your life if you'll hear it. The word offense, the Greek word for offense is the Greek word scandalon, from which we get our English word scandal. The word actually means, now please hear what I'm about to say. The word actually means, the, 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 the word scandalon actually is the trigger on a trap. It's the word actually means the, the thing you step on that causes the trap to close around you. So here's what you have to know about offense. Every offense, especially a major one like that, is a trap to keep you from a place of promotion. Mm -hmm. And I will say this by revelation and experience. Your greatest offenses always come just before your greatest promotions. I'm going to say it again. Your greatest offenses. That's good, Bishop. Will always come just before your mm -hmm. greatest promotions. So if you know that, then it makes your response to it very, very simple. This is why Jesus said, when men curse you, speak ill against you. He says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. He's not telling you to rejoice because you got offended. He's telling you to rejoice because in the revelation knowledge of scripture, you should know that if that is what is happening to you, something supernatural is about to manifest for you because the enemy is trying to trap you. He's trying to block your next move. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's what I would that's say. Powerful. No, that's 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 powerful. That's powerful, Bishop. You know, uh, when John's disciples came to Jesus and they questioned who he was, and you know, he said he told them to tell him all the signs which he would recognize. Then that's kingdom manifestation. But right. he also said and tell him, bless who is not offended. That's it. By, by, by me. <laughs> that's, that's what he said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what he said, man of God. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Bishop, man, you've been been tremendous. This has been a tremendous uh, conversation and discussion, uh, man. Will you will you talk to the audience uh, in a little bit in in our closing? And also, I want to, uh, to make sure that everyone uh, sow seed and be a blessing. Uh, to our speaker, you can text C E M M to four one four 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 in order to uh, sow a seed into uh, his ministry. Well, Bishop, will you will you talk to us in closing? Well, first of all, let me just say to you, Apostle, uh, you're doing a great work. Uh, you are uh, marrying. Uh, academic excellence with spiritual insight and wisdom. And this is something that is desperately needed in the church of the Lord Jesus at large, but especially in the church of the Lord Jesus that has African-American leadership and leadership 
of color. And so I want to salute you, thank you, and appreciate you. You know, these types of things, uh, this is work to do this on your part, <laughs> you know, to be consistent in doing such a thing like this is work to do. And the body of Christ needs it. Uh, I'm thankful God didn't tell me to do it, uh, but he, <laughs> but he has allowed me to come on and join men of God like you who are doing it. And I think that is to be celebrated and appreciated. And so I want to encourage people to continue to pray for you, your ministry, this assignment, and continue to support it. Uh, I would also, and, and I mean that very seriously because I recognize what it takes to do this kind of thing. And just to say yes to the Lord in the myriad of other responsibilities that you have. So I want to encourage God's people to hold you and your family up in prayer and to support your ministry and the work that you continue to do by the grace of God. And then secondly, I would just encourage God's people to recognize that we are in uh, tremendous moments of opportunity, promotion. Uh, and I really do believe uh, that, as I said before, even though the events and the environment that this coronavirus pandemic has created were not of the Lord, not by the Lord, not God's idea, as in all things that the enemy does, God will use them to expand and to uh, further uh, and even expedite, in some cases, his purposes in the earth. I believe, and I've said this for some months now, that the church has been in a divine sila in these moments of pandemic and restrictions and closure. You know, the psalmist uh, would write things that were very profound and very erudite and spiritual in the Psalms. And then every once in a while, he would write the word sila. And the word sila means calmly think about that. It literally means before you go further, reflect on this, give this some observation, some meditation and some time before you read the rest of this psalm. I believe that the Spirit of God has placed the church globally in a divine sila. And he is saying to everyone from bishops and apostles and prophets and pastors, evangelists and teachers to the people who attend, calmly think about what has happened and what is happening before you go on to what's next. Reflect on this hear my voice in it, get my instruction from it and move on because we are not to go back to things as usual. That's right. Because things as usual right. were not producing the divine purpose and promise of God in the earth for the church globally, but specifically in America because we had mega church and many impact on the culture. And so I believe we are in a divine sila as we are coming out of this. I, I believe that it is not to be expected for things to go back to normal, but for things to go forward to purpose, not back to usual, not back to normal, but forward into what is purposed. And that does not look like it's not going to look identically like the entertainment modality of church that we were engaged in before. And I really believe that the Spirit of God is taking the church from the production of entertainment to the production of evidence. Now, I want to say this very cautiously because I don't think men and women of God were trying to entertain. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not saying that preachers were trying to entertain. What I'm saying is the modality, the structure in and of itself produced a certain environment that can't be shaken because it's not necessarily the divine order and structure. And so I would say to people, you know, a, a lot of, for a lot of for several years now, people have been talking about getting out of the box 
you know, and I would simply say to every pastor, preacher, leader, listen to me, the box is broken. <laughs> so, so you don't even need to worry about getting out of it. <laughs> simply allow the spirit of God to lead you and guide you into what you are to do for this next wave and phase of ministry. And if you do what he says do, there will be a commanded blessing upon it that uh, that you will not even be able to measure. So that would be my encouragement, Apostle. I don't know if that's what you wanted, but that's mm -hmm. what I sense in my spirit in closing to share. No, no, thank you, Bishop. And I really appreciate appreciate your scholarship. I appreciate your prophetic insight. And, uh, and of course, you know, I'm going to take you up on helping me with this kingdom theological seminar. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I was, as I was listening to you uh, later on, I'll share with you, but heard the Lord say something that you really can, can help help with. It seemed like every time you meet somebody and go to talking to somebody, God tell you, he's going to tell you <laughs> about, about this seminary now. <laughs> so, well, so, I'm honored to be considered and, and uh, look forward to further discussions about it. Thank God. For um, you. Oh man. Well, listen, if you, if you would, if you wouldn't mind, would you pray for the audience? Absolutely. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today for the opportunity and the privilege that we have had to be, first of all, with you, and then with this man of God and the constituency, the audience that, uh, that he engenders. We thank you for your wisdom. For you said wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, we are to get wisdom and in all our getting to get understanding. And I pray now that the spirit of wisdom and of revelation knowledge in the anointed Jesus and in his anointing would be released upon every hearer. Father, I pray for your people now, for your word declares that the Holy Spirit will lead us into truth. And so I pray now that you take your sons and daughters further into truth, even beyond what we have been able to share. Give them the portion that is specific for them. And we pray your kingdom, your rule, your realm, your royalty come in the earth and your will, your determined resolve, your benediction be done in every life and circumstance. I pray for your people that they be healed from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And we vow my father to give you the praise and the glory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And now we pray the hedge of protection around each and every person under the sound of my voice in the north, south, east, and west around them, their families, their households, their goods, and all they have on every side. We pray that everything their hands touch yes, continue Lord. to prosper. Yes, yes We pray in the name yes, of Lord. Jesus that they continue to increase in the yes, land which you have given them. And we decree that the angels of the Lord in camp round about us today and they deliver us because we are those that fear the lord in jesus name amen amen hallelujah well man it's been wonderful bishop i'm gonna i'm gonna give you a call a little later uh now the the name of your church it it, it uh it's the place of grace now yeah the name of the church is the place of grace that's the name of the facility the building, the corporate name is Full Harvest International Church. And then our our uh, network of ministries is the Global Grace Network. But the name of the church is the Place of Grace Cosmopolitan Center in Los Angeles, California. All right. Well, man, listen, I wanted to make sure we got that out there. Man, it's been such a a, a, a blessing chopping it up with you. I'm, 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 uh, I'm gonna give you a call a little later. And man, thank you so much. I love you. I look forward to going nothing but up together. It's thank been our joy, Apostle. Thank you for including us. And uh, we truly pray God's blessing continually, continually on everything your hands touch. Okay. Thank you. Bless. God bless. God bless. Well, listen, beloved, please make sure you sow into uh, bishops, uh, uh, into him. He's blessed you. 
and you learned, he taught uh, CEMM to 41444. And those of you that uh, would like to be a blessing to our ministry, as Bishop uh, told you about our Kingdom Theological Seminary, the you can sow uh, online, our cash app or Zelle. But we love you so much. Uh, thank you for uh, extending your time with us. But this was good. This was good. He's a teacher. And so, man, we had to, this was great prophetic insight and teaching. So we appreciate him and we appreciate you. So until next time, Shalom. God bless. <laughs>